So Eddie, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Um, I'm interested really to learn about your perspectives about the Ashtanga Vinyasa practice, um, particularly its practice as we get a little bit older and ensuring that the practice suits our needs and also just to get your, your experience and, and your own personal understanding. So first of all, uh, before we start, can you just give me a little bit of background how you first got into Ashtanga? Um, sure. Uh, I started doing yoga in around 1986, 1987 in New York. And um, I uh, actually met Patabi Joyce in India in 1990, and then went back to study with him again with um, Sharon Gannon and David Life, whose yoga school I was working at in 1991. Um, so that's how I got started doing the practice. Uh, I hadn't um, known what it was or practiced it before I started learning it in India. Okay, okay. And so you've been practicing since 1990s, that's over, over 30 years, 32 years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and during that time, um, how was your, obviously that's a long period of time to be practicing yoga, first of all, but also as you've aged, you're still very young, you look fantastic. I, I'm not sure what your age is now, but how has your, do you feel your practice has changed as, you've, as you age? Have you had to modify things as your spine has perhaps um, changed, but it's got stiffer or, you know, what's, what's your experience? Well, my body has definitely changed. Um, and um, the, um, I mean, my, uh, physically, my weight is roughly the same as it was um, uh, 30 years ago. I'm probably, my guess is, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 pounds heavier now than I was, you know, when I was back in my fighting weight. Um, so, and that's pretty normal. Um, I think that as far as uh, physical capacity goes, that um, the yoga has served me very well and that I still have um, a good amount of strength, a good amount of flexibility. I have facility with my body that I'm happy with. And I think that the, um, the, uh, the balance of my body also is um, in terms of um, balance between the right and left side and about you know the height of my uh, pelvic girdle and height of the shoulders and all that has stayed relatively the same as well. Not a lot of imbalances from doing lopsided practices or things like that. So uh, even though we find a lot of things um, in Ashtanga yoga where they're say, oh, is the right side first or going to the right first, uh, doing the leg behind the head poses with the same leg first and another leg sometimes on top of that and not reversing that doesn't seem to have really caused any severe imbalances in um, the musculoskeletal system. Um, uh, the thing that has been hard on my body has been teaching. And the idea that I had that teaching meant putting people in postures and helping people in a lot of postures. And so I think the main thing that I've learned over the years is that um, to be an effective teacher means that you shouldn't be doing people's practices for them by helping them get into the things that they can't do, but find ways to help them learn how to do the things that they can then do on their own and then feel a sense of mastery or accomplishment or facility. Um, and so in trying to do too much for people, I spent a lot of time, you know, in awkward positions, bent over bodies, um, lifting people up from positions that were, you know, not great for my spine to be putting my body into and doing that repeatedly for, you know, four or five hours a day for a 25 year period. Um, so that is um, occupational hazard of how I interpreted the teaching of Ashtanga yoga, you know, was my interpretation because that's what I observed other people doing partially. Um, but it was also because I thought, well, if that's what I see them doing and I think that's how it's supposed to be done, then I'll do it also, but I wanna be good at it. So I'm gonna do even more of it. 
And so that was for a couple of decades, that was my approach to teaching. Um, so it's a mix, you know, it's a mix of observing what you see in the environment and then your own mental, emotional um, tendencies that drive you to do things in a particular way. And um, my, uh, my particular makeup is to, you know, to do a lot. And um, so uh, I think that that has been the main thing which has caused me to have back pain, not so much the yoga, um, but more the way that I was teaching. Okay. And did you find that the, did you find the practice supported you in your teaching or did you find that you had to perhaps add other things in to, to help you adjust people and teach so much? Or did you feel that the, the practice covered everything for you? Um, how do you mean specifically? Also, for example, did you feel that you needed to do um, extra strengthening work on your back because you were bending over so much, um, helping helping teach people, for example? Um, no, I didn't really think that. But what I did do for a long time was I had to resort to going to um, either chiropractors or acupuncture. And I ended up doing things outside of my practice to try, you know, try to find relief to whatever pains I was getting. Okay. Um, rather than really realizing that, you know, my pains were being self-inflicted. And so if I just changed my, my modus operandi that I would not have the same outcome. So it wasn't until about probably, uh, maybe five or eight years ago that I started beginning to really uh, experiment with doing things differently with my body in different types of ways, even within the context of the practice um, of Ashtanga yoga. So, and in the past two years, that's, um, that has uh, um, accelerated quite a lot as well. Could you give us some examples of, of, the, of the changes that you've made and the things you've been experimenting with? Sure, I started um, experimenting primarily first with the sequences that I was seeing in Gary Kraftsau's book on, um, it was not on yoga therapy, but it was a book that had, um, I guess it was a yoga therapy book. It was a lot of different sequences for students of his and how he was treating their um, different uh, problems that they were having, whether it was physical or mental or emotional. And um, that uh, that actually that book came out in the um, early 2000s so that was quite some time ago just, now that I think back on it so about 15 years ago 18 years ago that book came out and I thought it was a wonderful book and I tried a lot of those sequences but I wasn't really teaching them to people I was just using them for myself and I thought they were really good and um, then whenever uh, I came across a book say uh, it was something by uh, A.G. Mohan or the book by Sri Vatsa Ramaswamy or things of Desikachar that were coming out, I would try the practices that were, um, were, were in them, whether they were stick figure or um, photographs. So actually, now that I think it was way more than five or eight years ago, it's more like almost 20 years ago, like 15, 20 years. Um, and um, so while my body might be okay, my memory seems to be slipping in terms of time spans. And, um, and I would see that there were some um, sequences that seemed to be much more effective than others, generally speaking, and some that seemed like they were um, more thoughtfully or intelligently put together and others that just seemed like postures, you know, being put together, strung together. And um, I think that you know, it's just using the, the feedback of my own body and trying those different sequences to see what, what worked and what didn't. Um, and um, uh, Raghu Ananta Narayan had that wonderful book on storytelling and asanas uh, with some great sequences in it that I had tried also. I bought that book actually in, in Finland. So uh, I guess looking back on it now, even though sort of the undercurrent of my practice was all these primary, intermediate, and advanced sequences, um, on the outside of that, I was actually experimenting a lot with different things. 
Okay. And how is that, <clears throat> excuse me, with, with that perhaps um, other um, sources of information that you've looked at other than the Ashtanga system and, and learning perhaps a little bit more with yoga therapy and applying that perhaps to yourself, how has that um, led to you, your, how has that evolved your teaching? Has that changed the way that you teach now? Are you altering the, the practice more for people or, or how, how does that manifest now in your teaching? Yeah, so um, definitely over the last few years that I was traveling and teaching before COVID, I was usually doing the yoga therapy type class in every workshop, um, maybe a few times, maybe just one time, focusing on different parts of the body. Uh, so I was definitely already including that kind of stuff. Um, and um, one of the ways, one of the reasons why I started wanting to incorporate other ways of going about it was this lingering sense that, you know, yoga was originally for me and originally for yoga about spiritual evolution. It was about growth. It was about change. It was about transformation. Um, you know, not just accomplishment of physicality um, or endurance, but some uh, like deeply intimate uh, inner knowing of your own insides, you know, whether it was your body or your emotions or your mind or your tendencies, even things like doing neti and putting a tube or a string in your nose and pulling it out, give you an intimate sense of your body in a different way or any of the different yoga, you know, kriyas, the shat karmas that you see, give you a really different sense of the inside of your body. So you're not so squeamish about it or it's not so foreign to you. Um, you know, there's some of that in Ashtanga yoga, but not a whole lot. Mainly it's just some asanas that have a very strong and profound effect, effect as well. So they're not to be discounted, but they very obviously for me weren't the whole picture. And more of the picture was filled in aside from these other types of ways of looking at postures, but through learning Sanskrit, from learning puja, from chanting, through prayer, meditation, um, service, all of these things kind of filled out the picture for me of for what, what it was to live a yogic life. Um, and that's just how I always was, like before Ashtanga yoga and during Ashtanga yoga and whenever there's an after Ashtanga yoga, that's just how I am, that's how I'm made. Um, so I always needed those things and I continue to. Beautiful. Yeah. And that's, and that's becoming more and more uh, apparent in, in your teaching by the sound of it. Do you, are you teaching, so you're teaching elements of meditation and pranayama aside from just the asana? Yes, um, I've been teaching pranayama classes for some time. And um, I, um, and also I lead chanting classes in the temple, which is not really teaching people that, you know, this is how you chant, but group chanting that is led of different mantras and things like that. Um, so I, I've, I've never really not incorporated all those things. Uh, mainly I was doing a lot more of it when I was doing workshops and traveling and not as much in our school in New York. But now that I'm not traveling, of course, I just do all of it out from the temple and online and things like that and more of it. And, but specifically how's my teaching changed? Um, I, um, you know, we're just going back into in-person classes over the past month and a half or so. And we're really starting again because most of the people who used to practice in New York have moved out or, you know, they've gotten older, maybe they're not practicing. They've moved upstate or to California or Florida or wherever they've moved to, you know, like, and that's how it is for most businesses in the city. Um, everyone's, you know, who used to live here and do those things has moved away. 
So we have a smaller group now, a largely a new group of people. And I feel like I'm starting over again, like when I first had my school in 1993 um, and people started coming and, um, you know, but now um, I have the, some years behind me of, of patience, of going slowly, of um, considering the experience that they're going to have rather than back then thinking, here's the experience I want them to have that I'm gonna try to give them through being really top down heavy in, um, in my teaching. So now I think it's um, a little bit lighter, a little uh, less hands-on. Well, there, I, you know, and I think more about the uh, communication of teaching through verbal demonstration and as a last resort, maybe a physical assist. So if someone can be guided through a suggestion to move their body just a little more this way, then they might be able to be more comfortable in the asana and they can do that on their own. Then they've opened up their own neuromuscular pathway. They've opened up their own motor pathway through their own effort. And then that pathway will stay open. Uh, whereby if I hadn't done anything before and just come over and you know put someone into that posture, maybe those pathways wouldn't really open and where it would take a lot longer for them to and they would become dependent on the help. Um, so that is the um, setting that I had before where people were getting dependent on help or I was thinking that help was how to teach. Um, now, was it helpful? Yeah, probably, like it's good, it makes you feel good, you can make some progress. Um, you know, you learn how to do things on your own also at the same time. But it, um, you know, as far as being a sustainable way of teaching, uh, eventually the teacher is, their body will get tired from doing that, which we have seen in many examples. Um, and I felt my own body getting really tired from that too. Um, and as well, it's just, I don't think that was the purpose of why we came to do yoga in the first place, you know, uh, to get pushed further and further and further and further and further. Like, mm, no, I don't think that's really why yoga was being taught in the first place. Um, so. So do you, is the way you teach now with the with the students you have is it, is it kind of loosely based kind of loosely based on on perhaps the primary series or the intermediate series depending on there or is it is it a complete variation from that now? It depends. Um, for you know because the the sequences of primary and intermediate and third uh, on their own are very good sequences. They're nicely balanced. There might be a couple things that are weird here and there in them. But for the most part, they're like 95% really good. And that's a very good ratio for any codified system. Like no system is gonna be perfect. There's always gonna be a flaw in it when you have to adhere to things in a particular way. Um, uh, and some of the flaws that we might find in this particular system is um, that, for example, we're doing a lot of chatwari position, but we're never pushing back up the other way. Now, maybe in the old type of sun salutations, when you did these swivel arms and you pushed back up, um, like we used to do, that's a little bit more balanced because you get that pushing off from the floor um, action that is not happening now at all. So that's one thing that maybe could be like a, a, a small tweak. Um, but um, and you'll find that people are going to get tired a lot more quickly until they build up the strength to do a lot of push-ups in the practice. Uh, I never thought that Uttita Hasta Padambushtasana and Arudabhada Padmotanasana were in the right place. Um, I felt that that was an odd place to put those two poses and that following it with Utkatasana never felt good on my body. So I was um, pleasantly surprised to see from Manju when we met him around 1997 um, uh, that he told us that those two poses used to come at the end of primary series, that you would do par, up to Parashwotanasana and then Utkatasana, and that's where primary started. 
And then after Setu Bandhasana, then came Utita Hasta, Ardhabhadha Padmottanasana, followed by either backbending or Pashasana. And, um, and Shadat had told me at one point also that the first asana of primary series was Utkatasana and not Utita Hasta, that was just an extra thing. So, you know, there's some small things like that. And then there were some, and for whatever reason, the changes were made, they were. And then there are a couple of small things as well that I find in intermediate that I don't think make a whole lot of sense, but I see that in earlier times, the, the sequences were in a slightly different order. Mm. Um, so, but for the most part, they're good. So I, um, I do teach them and I, and I teach them the way that I learn them um, in uh, the same methodical type of way and in the same order. But if somebody has a problem somehow with something, they have a structural problem or they have a health problem or an energy problem, then I will begin to adjust things however I think I need to in a way that makes sense for them to benefit. Uh, and then that could be a variety of things. Um, I don't do that at all with third series. I think the third series poses are hard. They're hard for a reason. And um, you should only be doing them if your body can handle doing that, like do those things explicitly, like some things don't play around with. So that's sort of where I draw the line. Intermediate, um, I don't mind making some adjustments, but I don't do a whole lot of modifications on that. Um, again, because the postures are going to be a little bit more difficult. So it's okay just to say, you know, some things you just don't need to be doing, um, even if they're modified. And I think that's true with any system. Uh, but with primary series, I definitely take a lot of liberties. Um, and I use the knowledge that I have from my other studies to um, make sure that it makes sense. Um, it's structurally, it makes sense. And, regards to the organ systems, it makes sense. In regards to your breath level, it makes sense. Um, and I think that the, um, I think that it's good for people as well who have been doing primary for a long time and not done any intermediate. I think it's important for them to start extending their back in the opposite direction at a certain point. So Shalabhasana or Dhanurasana, Ustrasana or variations on those poses are a good thing for people to do in general. Um, and you will find pretty much in just about any yoga system, those asanas that are backbending asanas are not considered to be intermediate or more difficult or something that you're not allowed to do yet. Uh, there's something that they're incorporated usually very quickly. In Shivananda yoga, there you know, 12, uh, three of the 12 basic postures are going to be Bhujangasana, Dhanurasana, and Shalabhasana, all the different types of them. And you'll find the same, um, whether it's in any yoga system you can name, you're very quickly going to be doing a balanced um, array of poses. Uh, and so that's one of the things that also, you know, just going into say to Bandhasana or Urdhva Dhanurasana so quickly is gonna be tricky for a lot of people. But to do Shalabhasana instead of Setu Bandhasana, not such a big deal. And, you know, they're basically the same pose. Shalabhasana, turn it upside down, it's Setu Bandhasana. Um, it's just Setu Bandhasana, it's Shalabhasana on your head and your feet rather than your navel. So slightly different benefit, but um, same basic body shape. Beautiful. It reminds me, as, you, as you're speaking, it, it makes me think of a, of a couple of things. The first was when I was when I was um, first in Mysore quite early on, I started studying with a, a Dr. Jag. You had come across Dr. Jag? Yeah, yeah, I remember him. Um, and so I, I was studying in his clinic and helping his clinic and I was practicing Ashtanga at the time. And he had a great reputation of, of fixing really, really broken people. And he had a lot of people coming from all over the world and, and India at the time. And as I started to help him in the clinic, I was constantly thinking, well, how, because uh, he, he taught yoga therapy there. And I was like, how can I apply Ashtanga or the primary series to these really sick people? Mm -hmm. It's like, they couldn't, they couldn't even stand up. They couldn't bend forward or they, you know, so we could, couldn't start with a sun salutation even. So it really made me start to, to perhaps question 
um, set sequences because they just you can't adapt them very specifically for the individual. Um, which it sounds as you're as you're saying, you know, when someone comes in with a, a specific problem, sometimes you have to to put that to one side and, and start from scratch and do exactly what that individual needs rather than follow this doctrine or a very prescribed set of sequences. Yeah. Yeah. And so you need to develop a vocabulary. Um, and that takes some time to do. Uh, and not only do you need to develop a vocabulary, you have to um, spend some years watching people and um, seeing all the cues that you need to see to figure out what you need to do mm. to be helpful. Um, a mutual friend of ours, Peter Sensen, um, often tells me a few stories about his teaching and um, uh, his experience of, of being in Mysore in, in the early years. And he was saying that, you know, uh, Padabi Joyce and the Indian uh, students that he had, it was it was all therapy. It was it wasn't just this this bunch of asana and jumping around. It was therapy. He was really, really working with lots of different uh, sick people. Did you see that yourself? Was that did you have that same experience? Um, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is very much in line with with how and my understanding of, of Krishnachar and how he worked, particularly in, in Chennai. It, they were he was seeing patients for very specific problems, and again utilizing practices very specifically for the individual. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing art form. Um, yeah, it's a it's a real once once you understand that. Um, how things can be pieced together and how different practices can be utilized for specific problems. It uh, becomes a very, very powerful tool as I'm sure you've experienced for yourself, but also for your, for your students. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think that generally speaking, you know, most of the yogas I've seen, not all of them, of course, but most of them are really good. Um, and so a lot of it is just the adhikara or the eligibility or, you know, the, the needs of the individual who's coming to the practice. So I, um, you know, I like to remember back to my early days of practicing yoga in the 1980s where I didn't know the names of different systems and it was just all yoga, you know, there wasn't a lot of branding happening back then. And that was nice because you could do anything and learn anything and just do the things that seemed to work for you and not really have to worry about the actual, you know, get locked into a funnel of sure. um, identity. Yeah, yeah. We were going to, you know, all of us, meaning you, me, everyone has gone to, we go there because already we have an identity problem. And the identity problem is called asmita, which is identifying with something uh, other than what we truly are. We're identifying with a narrative. So, and there's an automatic draw pull towards yoga that I want to deal with this asmita, with my personal narrative that I'm always trying to reinforce. So I'm going to go to yoga to begin to release or diminish somehow this sense of I-ness. And then if you get locked into group identities or identity politics, then you begin reinforcing this false sense of self. And that happens a lot in the Western yoga world. There's, you know, I, I see these memes like when a yin yogi meets an ashtangi and I'm like, the, why would you even call yourself an ashtangi, you know, or a yin yogi? Like just the fact that you're doing that and, uh, you know, and I'm sorry anyone who's offended by me saying this, but I'd never call myself an ashtangi. Like, I wouldn't even call myself a yogi. I'm just someone who's doing yoga. And if you, the more you identify with that particular branding of the system, the more stuck you're going to get having to abide by a system. And what happens when that system stops serving you? Um, if all of a sudden you can't practice ashtangi yoga for any given reason, are you still an Ashtangi? Um, do, you, do you find excuses to say, oh, well, I'm not practicing the series, but I still feel like I'm practicing Ashtangi yoga because 
you know, I'm doing some types of breathing or vinyasa, and then you struggle to, to make excuses for um, the identity that no longer you're able to hold on to. I don't think we should be doing that. That's not good for us. Uh, it's not terribly healthy. We want to, we want to uh, begin to release some of those things. So, um, so I, I do feel free to use the tools at hand and to study new things and incorporate them, because we always have to remember when we're practicing and when we're teaching that of the actions in yoga like asana is one of the actions, pranayama is another action, the yama and niyama are other actions. Um, uh, all these things are sort of falling as well under the category of, of the kriyas of tapas, swadhyaya, and ishwara pranidhana. So if these are three actions of, of tapas doing something with the body or something to commune with the planet that we live on, to understand that our body is not just our own, but it's it's a manifestation of all nature and that the world around us is our extended physical body to really inhabit and dwell in that is a type of tapas. Um, and then with the study of scriptures and text and repetition of mantras and examination of our own motivations and tendencies and flaws, this is the swadhyaya. And then we have surrender of Ishwara Pranidhana. Uh, the different, many different types of surrender in faith and devotion and conviction, all those fall under that category. So like, if we remember those things when we're teaching and when we're practicing, then we can know what kind of outcomes we should be looking from, looking to for the, from the practices we do. So are the practices that I'm doing enhancing these, um, the outcomes of tapas, swadhyaya and ishwara pranidhana? Or, um, and how will I know? Because then the obstructions to knowing who I truly am, called the kleshas, will begin to diminish a little. The avidya of, um, of truly, like of not having a deep sense of my own self. I start to get a better sense of myself. And so that means avidya is diminishing, it's weakening. Um, if I'm not completely, truly bound to a narrative Maybe that someone else has created. Maybe it's a, a spiritual narrative or a yoga narrative, like the name of a system um, or a doctrine that I'm always repeating, even though maybe I don't believe it or I don't know what it, what it means. Uh, these are all narratives that we fall into. If I stop being a slave to those narratives, but I, I start having my own narratives emerging from me, which um, are not necessarily contradictory, that don't put me into conflict with other people, um, then we know that the asmita is beginning to diminish as well. And if the likes and dislikes are the things I'm really attracted or attached to and the things I'm really averse to, maybe if neither of those bother me all that much anymore, um, and I'm okay and start getting content with how things are, whether I get the thing I want or don't get the thing I want, you know, whether I get the thing come across towards me in my life that I really don't like, um, that it doesn't bother us that much, then we know the raga and dvesha are diminishing. And that's actually one of the effects of practicing asana, the tato dvandva and bhikataha, the transcendence of the pairs of opposites. Raga and dvesha, really they're, they're two sides of the same coin, attachment and diversion, but they also appear to be opposites. So anything which is an opposite in the world, hot and cold, pain and pleasure, success and failure, rich and poor, um, praise and blame, these are all appearances. They appear to be opposite, but really they're the same movement of energy swimming back from one fulcrum to another. And so when I transcend that and I'm no longer touched by that, that is the mastery of asanas, is what Patanjali says. And so then finally, we have um, the clinging to life, the fear of non-existence, sometimes translated as the fear of death. Um, this is the hard one. And Patanjali says this flows strongly, even in the wise, that you know we're going to fear not existing. We're going to fear death. Some people say they're not afraid of death. Perhaps they're not. Let's see what happens when they get a really big fright or on, they're on their deathbed. You know, We don't know. The fear of death is really subtle. <laughs> um, so, but anything that threatens your existence, 
that you fight against is also um, part of that Abhinivesha. Because if you look into some of the commentaries and you see that Abhinivesha is not so much the fear of death, but it's the fear of non-existence, of void, then anything that challenges your existence, someone insults you and you get a little bristly. That's actually an Abhinivesha because that's a fear of if they're right about me, then the thing that I think I am doesn't exist. And then who am I? And that not knowing and not having any ground to stand on is fearsome. Um, so that's why we bristle and hold on to it. Okay, so um, like if all these things are starting to lessen in us, then the yoga is working. But if these things are increasing and we're getting more arrogant about our accomplishments in yoga asanas or in pranayama or how long I can hold my breath or how long I can take an ice bath for, for example. Um, if I'm getting more arrogant about that and, you know, and I try to convince everyone who comes across my path that this is the best thing to do and they should be doing it and all other practices are inferior. And then if all these things start to increase, then the yoga is not really working all that well. Um, and so either you're doing it wrong or it's the wrong thing for you. There aren't too many choices aside from that. It's one or the other. You figure out which. <laughs> and so um, uh, anyway, so the, the most important thing that I think I can do for myself as a practitioner and for myself as a teacher is to always have that thought or those ideas activated in my body uh, and in my mind as I'm practicing and teaching. Uh, because otherwise, our physical bodies are very enticing. You know, there it's a field of, of infinite potential, of always doing more, of going further. And that stuff is really fun. And it can be, you know, cool and great and all that. And you can just make super shapes and expand your consciousness a little bit that way. But also, in subtle ways, you can get trapped in the identity with your physical capability being an expression of spirituality, where really what it is, is it's an expression of physical capability, um, which is great, which is fine. But we've been in the West, roughly, largely speaking, not for everyone, but for the masses, we've been confusing those two things. It's beautifully put, Eddie. I couldn't agree more with that in terms of yeah, especially in this, in this popular culture that we have now of, of Instagram and, and social media of this physical image that people are, are chasing and, and missing the point, not, not, not recognizing themselves from, from, from what they're doing and, and, and not learning from real yoga, true yoga, and, and kind of getting running on this, this, this kind of treadmill to physical, sometimes injury, because they're pushing their bodies so hard because they're ignoring the signs. But also that, as you as you kind of touched upon, the, the addiction that asana can can create, especially when it's, it's systemized and you're trying to, to follow this step-like pattern, the next asana being being the goal, it can it can really cloud your, your yeah. perception. Yeah. And um you know, and, and just wanting to be good at something. Like we do things and we want to be good at them. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but sometimes it can go a little too far. And one thing also I'd like to add is that missing the point is part of spiritual practice. And you look out through the ages and you're always going to see that it's a big part of it. Um, even Swami Vivekananda, he came to the West, he traveled all around America, he, he, and Europe, and he preached, and he built missions, and he, you know, had a tremendous amount of accomplishments, and he died very early, around 36 years old. By the time he died, he'd done more than most people have done in a couple of lifetimes. But before he died, he wrote this letter, uh, and I believe it was to Sister Nividita, might have been to somebody else, but he wrote this beautiful letter, you can read it in his books, where he says, you know, all this time I thought that I was serving Ramakrishna, Paramahamsa Ramakrishna, by traveling around the world and proclaiming his name and 
preaching about him and about Vedanta and opening missions and trying to teach people to meditate and do Raja Yoga and Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga and Jnana Yoga. But it was all arrogance. It was just my ego that was driving me to do all those things. And now I'm sitting here in bathing in an ocean of bliss, an ocean of his grace without a desire for anything, realizing how it was just my own arrogance that led me to do those things. But this is the only bliss there is here in surrender. And so it's a very beautiful letter and I can't do it justice because I don't have it in front of me and I can't, I haven't memorized it. But it showed that how even a great person, uh, a super amazing person like Swami Vivekananda also missed the point for a little while and some good came from it, you know? But he, he saw in himself where he had lost his true north. And we, saw, we find that example again and again in um, examples of saints or yogis or practitioners or a lot of people that we look up to that, you know, we all miss the point for a while. And, the, um, and that if we can course correct ourselves without a lot of bitterness or anger um, or judgment or shame, but we can accept that we miss the point because of some little flaw within us, then we can absorb that flaw that we had, whether it was arrogance or greed or jealousy, competition, um, any of any of them, uh, we can absorb it so it no longer becomes a thing that we're fighting against or that's driving us, and then it can begin to evaporate. Um, and then whatever is true and whatever is pure will reveal itself, and that will be the thing shining forth. Um, so, just as a way of saying anything I've said so far about like how the West has gone with yoga, it's part of the process. And um, so it's not a judgment on our culture. It's not a judgment on anything. It's, it's part of spiritual growth is to get it wrong and then to see it and then to shift. Beautiful. One of the questions I had for you was asking for a piece of advice that you might give to anyone who's kind of on their Ashtanga journey. But I think you've given, and everything you've said so far, you've, you know, you've said, brilliant piece of advice all the, all the way through. So um, unless there's anything that specifically you want to say, I'm not gonna even ask you that question. Um, no, I would simply say uh, we should enjoy our practices. We should find um, pleasure and satisfaction in them. And the pleasure and satisfaction should be um, something that doesn't cause problems in other areas in our life. And if we become obsessive about things, then, then you might have relationship problems. You might have, you know, you know, it, it, you might find yourself in situations where people don't understand what you're doing because you're doing it so intensely. So, but um, uh, enjoying our practices, finding pleasure in the practices, finding a deep internal satisfaction from doing them not exhausting ourselves. Uh, if you continue to hurt yourself in the same way again and again and again, then maybe there's something that you shouldn't be doing. And, and you can accept that and understand that you're not a bad Ashtanga yoga person because you can't do this particular pose. Um, it might not mean it's the end of the career. You might just need to. And if you can't sort it out with your teacher, you might have to find a different teacher who can work with you in a different way. Um, so, um, I think it's very good to apply effort. That's part of what we do as human beings. You know, we, we apply effort and we can make gains from them and that's good. Uh, and to learn when the effort is too much and that we're forcing. So when do we go from effort to forcing, um, from, uh, from contemplating mastery and skill to accomplishment for satisfying our own sense of self, just to be observant of those things. And if you observe those basic tendencies, um, then you probably won't get into too many physical problems because you'll understand 
when it's time for you to stop. And, um, and that's really a good thing to know. When is the right time for me to stop talking? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Fantastic, Eddie. Thank you so much. Eddie, um, so you, uh, you're, you've got a, a, a physical space again now, and are you on the road? Where can people see you? Are you doing workshops anywhere soon or online stuff? What are, what are your, uh, what's your program? Yeah, I'm at home now um, in, in, at the Broom Street Temple, like not right the second, but here I'm staying in New York now. We just reopened the Broom Street Temple, which is awesome. Uh, I teach online um, about four or five days a week, and I'm teaching in person um, about five or six days a week. And um, that's where you'll find me. I'm not really traveling and doing workshops. Uh, I might over the next year do you know, a day or two here or there if I happen to be going somewhere. But for the most part, I'm not really traveling um, until next year. Uh, I'm very happy to be home teaching again. And I'm also very happy to be home um, sort of building up from the ground up whatever the yoga teaching is now that I'm going to be doing. Uh, the next thing we have coming up that I'm excited about is, you know, I've never taught any teacher trainings at all over the past 30 years because in this particular methodology, uh, the students aren't allowed to do that, which is fine. And um, but um, I will be teaching a pranayama teacher training with my friend Robert Moses, and we're starting that at the very end of May. Uh, I spent a lot of time practicing other pranayamas other than the Ashtanga yoga ones, and um, we'll be focusing on them. They're very beneficial. There's a lot of research behind them, and. Uh, people don't need to be afraid of doing simple pranayama practices without having an advanced asana practice. Um, you know, if, again, if you do things sensibly, no harm comes and you get very good benefits. So we're going to be teaching people how to teach some very simple basic practices that are good for cardiovascular and respiratory health, and also very good for calming the mind and downregulating sympathetic nervous system. So I'm excited about that. And um, that's pretty much the, the thing which is occupying a lot of my time. I'm working on two books currently. Uh, one is called My Experiments with Yoga, and it's based on the past two years of research I've been doing on different yoga practices. And then the other one is a pranayama book to accompany the course that we're doing as well. Wow, sounds fantastic, Eddie. Sounds really exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing those books. Thank you. <laughs> Eddie, thank you so much for sharing your, your time and your experience. Um, I know it's going to um, be very insightful for a lot of people. Thank you for inviting me on, Rob. It's a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Eddie, thank you so much for that. That was, that was great.